leaving 12 people dead, millions without power, and nearly 100,000 people in shelters across Florida. Tomorrow, President Trump will get a first-hand look at the devastation in the state of Florida. Ellison Barber is live in Washington, D.C. with more on that trip and his new plan to sell tax reform to Americans. Ellison? Good morning to all of you. President Trump is set to travel to Florida tomorrow for the very first time since Hurricane Irma made landfall. FEMA administration, Administrator Long is traveling to the affected areas today, and the President will be making a trip to Florida on Thursday. The President's action during these times demonstrate why he's a true leader who can bring the country together and get things done for the American people. President Trump traveled to Texas twice after Hurricane Harvey wrecked havoc on the Lone Star State. The First Lady joined him there, and she is set to go with him to Florida as well, along with the Vice President and the Second Lady. Before he leaves, President Trump is reportedly planning to meet with moderate members of the House and discuss, among other things, tax reform, an issue high on the President's to-do list. The White House says they'd be happy to make a deal with Republicans and Democrats. Budget Director Mick Mulvaney says he hopes the final plan is not revenue neutral. We need as big and as a dramatic tax reduction and tax reform as we possibly can get. And I think if we look at this through that static model and say, well, uh, we're going to have to raise money over here to make up for t taxes for going over there, we will never get the size of the tax reductions and tax reforms that we need. Last night, President Trump met with six senators to talk about tax reform. The three Republicans, all members of the Senate Finance Committee, the three Democrats, all moderates, up for re-election in states then-candidate Trump easily won. Sources told Fox News Democratic Senator Heidi Heitkamp, despite attending a rally with the president last week, is not yet supporting a specific tax plan. But in a statement, the North Dakota senator said she was encouraged by last night's meeting, adding, quote, I hope these bipartisan discussions continue. Sources tell Fox News President Trump is planning to travel to 13 states over the next seven weeks to try and sell his tax reform plan to the American public. Steve, Ansley, Brian. All right, Ellison Barber, live in our nation's capital. Thank you very much. So the president is planning to sell the tax plan in 13 states in seven weeks. And the reason that is uh, so substantial is because he was given the opportunity to do that with the Affordable Care Act and doing something about uh, Obamacare. But he was specifically told by Mitch McConnell, Mr. President, I've got this handled. Don't do it. Well, now the president, with the benefit of hindsight, realizes that he really can't count on the Republicans in the Senate to do it. And so now he's going to have to pull out his best Monty Hall impersonation and try to let's make a deal with Democrats as well in the U.S. Senate. Yeah. And last night was so important because you have these vulnerable Democrats outside John Tester. You got to get to 60. But more importantly, if you don't want to be surprised and you're a Democrat, if you want to get uh, if you're the president and want to hear what Democrats want, want and what some of the hurdles might be. For example, I imagine during that conversation, Joe Manchin or Heidi Heitkamp says, here's the obstacle to me voting with you. And then the president would take note. Of course, his, uh, his uh, finance guys are there. And today he's going to be meeting with the problem solvers in the House. And the problem solvers in the House are people that are relatively open to doing this crazy thing called trying to get something done. Republicans in Congress need to get on board. They didn't do Obamacare. They didn't fix that problem. If they don't fix tax reform, they're in big trouble when they come to their re-elections. In other news, we have a Fox News exclusive. You know, five years ago was, the, was that terrible attack in Benghazi when Ambassador Chris Stevens and three other individuals were killed. Well, there are two men, they're contractors. They did fight for our country. One was a Green Beret, one was an Army intelligence agent. They started their own company. They're private contractors, and they said they can't stay silent anymore about what happened over there in Benghazi. That's exactly right. And uh, shortly after it happened, they were called back to Washington, and essentially they were told by a State Department contracting officer by the name of Jan Visentainer, and she is still there. And that's one of the reasons uh, they are speaking out right now, is because the people who are making decisions about security in Benghazi uh, are still making security decisions about all the other embassies. Uh, she told them essentially, don't talk to the media and get on the same page as uh, the U.S. Department of State. She also said in her, her which at that point was, it's all about a video in the very beginning. Uh, she also said that she did not believe that the embassy security personnel should have guns. And she said point blank to uh, the fellow she was talking to, and you're about to hear from him, she said, I don't think embassy personnel should have guns, the security uh, personnel, and you should support that too. And the guy, she was waiting for a yes or a no, and he just gave her a blank look. All right, let's listen. 
people who made the poor choices that actually, I would say, were more responsible for the Benghazi attacks than anyone else, they're still in the same positions, making security choices for our embassies overseas now. Given that the politics has been taken out of the Benghazi situation, now that there's no longer a candidate or anything related to it, we have an opportunity here to fix the problems that made it happen. One of the main problems is they hire this Blue Mountain Group, this tiny organization with almost no security experience out of Wales, leaving all these uh, U.S. officials basically naked to attack, and some of them paid, uh, paid the price with their lives. That's right. So these they bid for that. They wanted to bring in their 8,000 employees. They have a huge company, mm -hmm. or did at the time. They wanted to go in there and protect Chris Stevens, the ambassador, and his staff there. They were rejected because their bid was higher than this company out of Wales who hired security guards to protect our individuals when you have Al-Qaeda swarming them to protect them without guns. They were standing at the doors of the ambassador's office and where he lived, his residence, and they didn't have guns to fight off the swarming radical Islamic groups that were everywhere, according to Ambassador Chris Stevens. He wrote a, he wrote a cable to the State Department begging for more security. He said their compound could not withstand a coordinated attack 12 days later 12 days before he was killed the State Department admitted according to these individuals these two guys called them up and said we made a mistake we should have hired you we want you to go back in and we want you to protect ambassador Chris Stevens he's asking right. for more help they said they didn't have enough time and that was after actually two weeks before it happened uh, they realized in Benghazi the group and said hey can you come back we know you lost the bid by four percent can you come back because we feel uh, we're not safe and they said well we, we you know it's gonna take more than a week or two, mm -hmm. maybe we could be there in a month. Chris Stevens was dead just 12 days later. And uh, then after that, they were pressured by Hillary Clinton's State Department to keep quiet. Stay quiet. And the preservation of the company is the reason they did that. All right, so that was then. How can we move forward as a country to make sure this doesn't happen again? These guys are saying if something does not change, it's going to happen yeah. again. That lady still works at the State Department, they said. They said that the contracting rules are way outdated. They said in 1990, Congress passed a law where the contract always goes to the lowest bidder. It doesn't matter, you know, if they're going to have uh, second rate um, security. It doesn't matter. It's, if they're cheaper, we're going with them. They said the companies are cutting corners and they're racing to, to um, get the lowest contracts. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about ESPN. You know the network, which was for the longest time impenetrable and the blue and, and basically the standard when it comes to sports coverage, has found itself in a lot of trouble late. In fact, they have a series of layoffs and they have programming changes. And now we find out that even last year alone, their revenue was down 23%. And I think perhaps if you look at this last incident, you could see what is playing into the ratings decline. More and more, this sports network seems to have a political agenda. And if you you see this Jamil Hill, who's uh, co-hosting, I believe, the 5 p.m. show, and what her comments were, you see that the danger that they're losing, whether you are biggest President Trump fan or not, you are looking at a situation where 50% of the country are told to go jump in a lake. When you say this, Jamil Hill, Donald Trump is a white supremacist who has largely surrounded himself with other white supremacists. You basically told half the country that uh, we don't really uh, well, want you as a viewer. Well, she, she was involved, I, the way I uh, read it in the Washington Post this morning is she was involved in a kind of a Twitter back and forth. It started with Kid Rock and, and then it uh, uh, evolved into the conversation about the President of the United States. So given the fact that in the past, uh, ESPN has actually fired people over their social media comments, Kurt Schilling, of course, was criticized, uh, criticized the North Carolina bathroom bill. He got fired. It was interesting to see what ESPN decided to do. Would they fire her? Well, apparently they talked to her and then put this statement out. The comments on Twitter from Jamil Hill regarding the president do not represent the posi position of ESPN. We have addressed this with Jamil, and she recognizes her actions were inappropriate. All right, you guys, any comments on that? Uh, we want to hear from it. Uh, Jason Whitlock is co-host of Speak for Yourself on Fox uh, from Fox Sports 1. He'll be here in about uh, two hours. You think she should just stay within her lane, just stick to sports? I hear she's really good. I don't know much about her because I don't really watch ESPN. Right. But she has this 5 o'clock show I hear. She's really good. And people are saying, right. her critics are saying, stick to sports. We watch ESPN right. for sports, not for politics. I don't know a single person that watches that show that likes it. But Oh, really? Yeah. All right, now here's some more headlines for you. A big legal win for President Trump's travel restrictions. The Supreme Court will allow the White House to ban thousands of refugees from entering the U.S. The move comes after five justices backed up Justice Kennedy's decision to block a lower court's ruling that the policy is unconstitutional. Justices will hear full arguments on travel restrictions next month. 
Two more Americans joining the list of diplomats affected by unexplained attacks in Cuba. The State Department raising the total number of victims to 21, and that number could actually get bigger. Some Democrat or some diplomats are suffering from mild traumatic brain injuries, suffering from hearing loss and headaches, believed to be caused by a sonic device near their houses in Cuba. The U.S. expelled two Cuban diplomats over the incident, but it's unclear who is exactly behind those attacks. And those are your headlines. A lot of people think Russia's probably got a hand in it. <laughs> if you believe that. All right, uh, coming up on this Wednesday, former President Barack Obama calling the decision to end the Dreamer program cruel. But our next guest says no one has been more cruel to immigration reform than former President Obama himself. Glad you're up 17 minutes after the hour. Former President Obama lashed out against President Trump. You remember that last week on his decision to end DACA? Writing on Facebook about a, a four-paragraph uh, four story. But here's an excerpt. The shadow of deportation has been cast over some of our best and brightest young people once again. To target these young people is wrong. It is self-defeating and it is cruel. But our next guest says nobody has done more to poison the politics of immigration reform than President Obama himself. Former speechwriter for President George W. Bush, Wall Street Journal Com. Thomas, Bill McGurn. Bill, how is Senator Obama right. laying the groundwork uh, to really poison the well on immigration reform? Well, look, in 2007, the stars were in alignment for an immigration bill, comprehensive uh, immigration reform. And it was uh, a group of the Senate mostly McCain and John Kyle working with Ted Kennedy to come up with the compromise bill that was supported by President Bush. There was a group of senators, I don't know, about eight that were drafting the legislation and making real compromises, right? And it included the DREAM Act in that, in that bill. Senator Obama came by, suggested a few small changes. They accommodated him, thinking he was a uh, a yay vote. And then he backed these poison pill amendments. Um, there, were, there were about five of them, but the key one was uh, introduced by Senator Dorgan on guest workers. These were amendments designed to kill the deal, to make people walk out because it's taking something else away, mostly on guest workers. And Barack Obama voted for those amendments. Um, so it, it's John just. John McCain at the time says uh, he thinks he poisoned the well because he didn't want Bush and, more importantly, McCain to be part of an Probably. immigration. Uh, and reform. that's been his pattern. I think that he preferred to have the issue to bash Republicans on rather than actually have have reforms. And also, Bill, on top of that, this thing was ready to go. He had a four page Facebook post seconds after right. President Trump uh, right. made his DACA. decision. Yeah, I mean, on DACA, too. Look, no one has been a lot of people criticize us for it, but no one's been stronger for immigration than the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal was very critical yeah. of uh, President Obama's moves on DACA u using executive authority that he himself admitted he didn't have. I think the Wall Street Journal, am I right, supported the Gang of Eight. Yeah, and they, but they've criticized. We've we've criticized Barack Obama throughout his administration for these for these orders. They're not even executive orders; different memos because they poison the well by making people think it's an unfair process. Donald Trump has returned it to Congress where it belongs, right. and they should work out a deal with compromises. And it might be happening. Call me naive, but Nancy Pelosi did have a meeting yesterday with Paul Ryan, and they are talking about some type of border security in exchange for these uh, the DACA thing. Right. So we'll see. There's a lot of deals you can imagine, um, but the point is that's where the authority is in Congress. That's right. where the reform should come from. And people should look at people's track record before they right. take things at Facebook value. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Bill McKern wrote about it and talked about it. Thanks so much, Bill, for kicking us off. Thanks, this morning. Brian. All right. Straight ahead. Remember the teacher who kicked students out of her class for wearing pro-Trump T-shirts? We've got a big update on that just ahead. And the liberal media says denying climate change is killing us and should be considered a crime. Here's some quick headlines for you now. A Maryland city opening up their polls to illegal immigrants. The College Park City Council passing a measure allowing citizens to vote in local elections. Supporters say it will make the city more inclusive. Critics claim it violates the Constitution. And immigrant rights groups want ICE to tell them when and where they plan to carry out raids. Groups nationwide have filed a Freedom of Information Act request demanding information on planned sweeps from 24 ICE field offices. Steve? All right, Ainsley, thank you. It was a benefit meant to raise money for hurricane, meant to raise money for hurricane victims, but it didn't take long for Hollywood to make it political. Anyone who believes that there is no such thing as global warming must be blind or unintelligent. 
That's Stevie Wonder. And they're not the only ones. These headlines doubling down their climate change attacks. The nation saying climate change denialism is literally killing us. And another from the outline, climate change denial should be a crime. Well, that's new. Here to react, climate researcher and the author of An Inconvenient Deception, which looks at Al Gore's book and is actually outselling Al Gore. Dr. Roy Spencer joins us from Nashville today. Uh, Dr. Good morning to you. Good morning, Steve. Well, it shouldn't be surprising if you have two big, powerful hurricanes in a row. There are going to be some people who said, uh, we've never had that before, so it must be climate change. Oh, and we knew this was going to in terms of the height because, as you know, we've gone almost 12 years without a major hurricane hitting the United States. So we've got, we've got a nation of teenagers who virtually none of them ever remember hearing of a major hurricane hitting the United States. And when I say major, I mean a Category 3 or stronger. So are you a climate denier? Because it sounds like, while well, those other people on the political you know, obviously, we've got to penalize, as we just saw, climate deniers. And yet, it, it, uh, human activity, as we've chatted before, may not be uh, necessarily related to this. Well, f yes, frequently I am called a climate denier. I don't know why. I believe that some of the warmth that we're experiencing now is due to the carbon dioxide fuels. But, you know, when these big events happen, you know, major hurricane, whether it's Harvey or whether it's Irma, you have to look back in history to see the context. And I believe uh, I have a graphic that I sent you that you might be able to show, yep. which shows all the major hurricanes which have hit uh, Florida since 1900. And basically that way each dot is a hurricane. Right. And what you see is that over time, and this includes Irma, this